Well, hi there again. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back to uh, the next in our series of webcasts. This is number six, I think we've got to. Um, time flying. Um, this is really backed by popular demand. We, we uh, started this conversation a couple of weeks ago. Had some fantastic guests. Uh, they've all been brilliant and uh, agreed to come back. Um, but it's the second part of our conversation on, on pace bowling. Uh, and I know that um, I think the intention is tonight to uh, veer from technical, which was a couple of weeks ago, uh, more towards the tactical side of things, um, which will be really interesting. And hopefully when uh, cricket does resume, um, if and when cricket resumes over the next few weeks and months, uh, this will set us up nicely. Um, just to say hello again to our various guests. So um, thanks again for joining us, uh, Liam. Liam Norris back. Thanks, mate. Nice to see you. All right. Oh, nice to be here. And uh, we've also got Izzy with a new haircut this time round. All right, thanks for having me. Yeah, you, can't, you can't miss Izzy there, look. Fantastic, shining like a beacon. Um, and um, our very own Jonesy. Thanks, Jonesy, for joining us. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me again. No worries. And, um, and to kick us off and to guide us through the next hour um, is uh, OHD. Hi, OHD. How are you doing? Hello, everyone. You well, mate? Yeah. yeah, all good, thank you. Been doing much bowling practice, mate? Bits and bats, bits and bats, so uh, yeah, I can do in yeah. the garden. Got, got my med ball here for slamming around. Lovely, but, lovely, yeah. lovely. So getting through the action a bit. A little bit, a little bit. Have you got a ceiling high enough, mate? Garden, garden's the best place for it. Fair yeah. enough, mate. Hopefully the well, weather holds. Yeah, good, good plan. Um, so, mate, I guess we're we're going to veer towards the, the the tactical side of things today, if that's all right. And I'll I'll uh, I'll let you get on with it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, last time was brilliant. You know, I think we we had an hour slot, and we ended up going for, on for about an hour and twenty minutes, just talking fast bowling, which was absolutely brilliant with these guys. Loved being a fast bowling badger. Something we don't often get to do, but it was it was brilliant. So yeah, try to veer away from technical a bit. We did a lot of that last time. Uh, so we're going to try work on a bit of a tactical stuff today and maybe plan. So first question would be to both Izzy and Pasty, but I'll go to Izzy first. Um, can you remember a time when you had a, the perfect plan and that the plan you had worked out absolutely perfectly? Um, I think for me, over the, over the last summer, I was playing for Vipers. I got my wicket was, I'd spoken to Captain during the week and we said, like, if I was going to bowl my bumper, then... Um, square leg and fine leg out and then keep keep my mid wicket in slightly closer just in case it came off the kind of top of the bat and yeah I was quite we're quite lucky and that's exactly what happened so it was nice to kind of all that thought and planning to kind of come out come out well yeah love it uh, and you pastor um the one that kind of Springs to mind is uh, start of 2017 season, first four day game of it. Uh, we, I was playing for Gloucestershire, we we're playing against Kent. Darren Stevens came to bat and he had taken the game away from us quite a few times. So we just had the plan of we're going to bowl three, uh, two bumpers in a row, trying to take his feet away and then hit the stumps. And luckily, I bowled two decent bumpers and then managed to hit off stump with my third ball. So um, it's not often a plan happens quite as quickly as that and quite as well as planned as that. So it's quite nice, really. Love it. It's amazing that sometimes even a bad plan is better than no plan at all, isn't it? So, yeah, it's nice when things work out like that. Um, I know it's going to be different for the, the, the boys and girls watching, but can you talk us both through? I'll come to you first, Pastor. How do you prepare tactically for a game? Uh, so, tactically, it, it's about your opposition. Um, obviously, like I said, boys and girls at home might might not know as much about their opposition, or they, they might not, or we have the luxury of having um, footage and their stats and such like so we can uh, prepare quite in depth but generally i try and look at the opposition uh for a four-day game i try and uh, watch a little bit of footage i'm not watching too much i think i get a bit up in my own head about it so i'll try and just watch their top eight batsmen uh watch their common dismissals and just think how i can go about my game and bring those kind of shots and dismissals into play for 50 over and t20 i will look at similar again their dismissals but also where they score predominantly their runs and I had to try and go in with a plan um, of how to combat that. The new is? Um, yeah, uh, for me I like to be, before the game, I like to be really kind of clear with both coach and kind of captain as to what, what role they want me to do and I think that's really important for me having 
clarity in the job that they're going to ask me to 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 do really and then you know training throughout the week and warm up on the day I can make sure I'm tailoring that practice to exactly what job I'm going to need to do so if they're going to want me to bowl at the death I'll just practice Yorkers slower balls and if it's at the top just making sure I'm hitting that top of off so I think just being really clear on plans is probably important most important thing for me. Love that. That's something we've talked about a lot and into you know preparing why would your first Yorker of the day be in the game? Um, you know, if you know you're gonna have to bowl Yorkers up there, you'd get them in, in practice. Like like I said, Jonesy, um a lot, you know, mine and Pasty and Izzy's preparation, we're lucky we've got analysts and we've got footage of all the, the batters we're gonna play against. Um what would you be saying to the boys and girls at home about preparing tactically for uh, for any day's cricket they're gonna play? Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, and obviously it's important for us to to make sure that we're we're um, making this relevant for the, the boys and girls watching throughout the pathway. So what I'd say there is, um, I think it's got to be, uh, it, well, it's hugely important that um, any bowler, um, whether you're taking a new ball or whether you're first change, first innings, second innings, doesn't matter. You need to be 100% clear on what your plans are and also how that translates to the fields. Um, so that's something that we, we've tried to push quite a lot at the, well, throughout the whole pathway, really. Um, and it's part of, you know, the tactical awareness and the um, that uh, sort of developing that side of, of, of cricket and bowling, which is obviously hugely important. So what I'd say to the boys and girls listening is that, you know, get get comfortable setting your own field, um, get comfortable uh, with sort of knowing what it looks like. Uh, and obviously that's going to be, it's going to be changeable between the different formats. Um, you know, so some of the some of the boys and girls might be playing multi-day cricket. Um, the majority of them will be one-day cricket, but the, the probably there probably isn't going to be too much variation with with the field that you're going to set for your best ball. Um, so it's it's more for for the boys and girls listening in the, in the pathway. It's more about um, understanding your game, your strengths, um, knowing where you want your fielders to be, um, and being really confident in doing that. Because if you can. If you can be really confident and you know your game inside out from a tactical point of view, then you're you're doing you're doing yourself and you're doing your team a massive favour. You're almost becoming a captain yourself, um, and it's one less thing for for the captain to to have to ask you about. Um, because if if you if you're asked that question at the top of your mark and you don't quite know, then that can take away from you know your 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 thoughts and your mental. Um, sort of uh, mental effort going in towards trying to work out the batsman. So you'll do yourself and your team a massive favour if you know exactly what your field is going to be. Yeah. Can I can I just ask Ollie, um, how, how, does a, how would a bowler balance between obviously finding a really good area, top of off, you know, red, red ball cricket talking about now, yeah. and obviously trying to expose and discover a batter's weakness, to bearing in mind that a batsman is... Is, is at his most vulnerable in the first 10, 15 balls of any innings. Yeah. Um, we talk about top of off, but I guess you want to discover wh where some weaknesses could lie, uh, I, I guess, you know, in terms of whether they're good at taking on the short ball or offside, leg side and so on. I don't know who wants to start with any of that, but just throwing that in. Well, I, I'd, I'd, okay. I, I'd imagine, we, I mean, we've got a plan that is, First ball to any new batsman, we're trying to hit middle stump halfway up. You know, no new batsman wants to face a ball that's going to cannon into the stumps halfway up. Maybe off stump halfway up, maybe middle stump halfway up. And I think that first 15, 12, 15 balls, you, you want to hit the stumps as much as possible. And then you're dead right. From there, you probably move out slightly towards the top of off stump, towards your best ball. And if we're talking multi-day cricket, red ball cricket, you know, you've got to test them out with the odd bumper. And then you'd hope, you know, I've obviously got a bit of experience now, same as Jonesy, same as Izzy, same as Pasta. You, you know, you're going to pick up things in people's technique, the way they hold the bat. If you imagine a Dom Sibley, we all know what Easter bat's like, his hands are right under the bat, sorry like that, he's going to be good for the leg side. Whereas if someone stood really open, showing your stumps, that's just to me, maybe they're good from through the offside um, and adjusting your, your line accordingly. I don't know what the other guys think to that. I think if I'll come in in there, and I think just if we're if we're relating it back to again to the boys and girls listening on the pathway, um, playing through the, through the age groups and also playing club cricket on the weekends, um, what I what I encourage the bowlers to do is to 
obviously during during the winter you're doing your training in the week your preparation and whatever you, th you might be thinking about technical stuff but then when it gets to a Saturday you need to be you need to try and throw all the technical thoughts and processes out out your head uh, you know trust yourself that you've you've got prepared and get fully involved tactically and mentally in the game and what I'm, what I mean by that is and I think I'll try and answer your question a little bit Paul um, so if if you're if you're not that experienced and you are like a young a young player and you might not have played against a certain player before you know just si simple things like say if you if, if you bowl if you bowl uh, a half volley swinging away a little bit and the, and the batter creams you through the offside through the covers for four then make a note of that and don't just think well that was that was a bad ball you know I've been hit for four my teammates going to be thinking this you know my mom and dad might be thinking that just stay involved in the game tactically and think right well he's played a good shot there you know he might he might be a you know he might be a good driver of the ball he might be looking to get on his front foot and then he might do that again to another bowler when you're at fine leg so you need to start making mental notes and then building up a picture of, of the players that you that you're facing you know a player might be very quick on a on a short ball and pull you for four or pull you for six so ideally if you know if you're if you are against players who are strong in certain areas you want to try and stay away from that as much as you can and obviously the, a caveat to that would be that you know sometimes your strength can be your weakness and getting a, a strong drive of the ball to, to drive might bring him bring out the nick um but i think if you can build up a picture of of the batter's strengths which is what what the question was paul if you can do that um on the fly online basically while, whilst you're playing and stay too far away stay far away from technical thoughts or you know, negative thoughts about certain boundaries that you've leaked, and that that will help build a picture, and then you know try and come to a sort of tactical decision about where you need to bowl to that player. So, and I think you'll st the longer you play cricket, and you know the boys and girls listening are relatively young, some of them, you'll see patterns come up. Like you said, batsman there, you talked about whacking one through the covers. You know, you'll you'll be able to the more you play, the more you'll see patterns and think, oh, okay. He's really good to the covers off driver. I've got to keep my um, line a bit tighter here. I might have to bowl middle and off to him instead of hanging it outside off. All those sort of things. The longer you play, the more you start to see patterns like that. And I suppose what, one thing I would say, we talked about there about how the, the guys here prepare tactically. I know you guys can't, can't uh, watch him back home, can't watch footage of players, but you might be coming up against a player that you do know or you have played against. Just bear that in mind, whether that's on the way to the ground or the night before. But even if it's just you visualising before you got to bed the night before, you bowling your best ball to a right-hander, you bowling your best ball to a left-hander. That is, in my mind, some good tactical preparation. Even if it's just as simple as that. If you're playing at a ground you know, Mosley, say, you can imagine yourself running down the hill at Mosley or you can imagine yourself running up the hill at Mosley. That, as simple as that is, that is a good way to prepare tactically because you're just visualising yourself doing it. I don't know what you guys think of that. I think that's a really good point um, about the grounds, actually. If you if you know you're going to play at a certain ground and you've played there before, then, you you know, each ground's different. And I think going back to preparing to play against a certain player, equally, you've got to prepare to play at the ground you're playing at. And if you know, you know the ground, so like you said, the hill at, the hill at Mosley, if you know there's going to be a hill, just bear that in mind. So when you get there, you're not, you don't want to get to the ground and kind of be surprised and be like, oh, oh wow, there's a hill. I haven't prepared for a hill. But actually, if you know that's there, just bear that in mind when you're thinking before the game and kind of trying to visualise everything and just make sure that it doesn't catch you off guard almost. Yeah, and that ties into the preparation side a little bit like we spoke about last week. Um, so if you if you do rock up to a ground that you've never played at before, then you, know, you need to bowl from both ends, really. You need to get a decent amount of balls in from both ends. So you can feel the ground, you know exactly what it is. There might be little undulations or there might be, you know, a bit of an incline or whatever, decline or whatever. But you need to, the worst thing to do in that situation is to to learn that in the game when you bowled your first ball or you're in your first over because that can be, be a bit of a jolt and then that might set you back a little bit and then you're worried about your fit placement when you're running in. Whereas, you know, when you're in a game, we want you and ideally we, we need all our players, particularly our bowlers, because we know how important bowling is, we we win games of cricket, so we need our bowlers to be thinking tactically and, and trying to work work batters out and and being confident and not worried about things that they should have done and should have ticked off at the start of the game in their prep. Yeah. That's being brave as well. I mean, 
you've talked there, Rich, about setting fields, and you know, Greasers have talked about bat bull and a bouncer to find out about. That's, that's, you've got to be brave to do that. You know, you've got to be brave to set your own field. I made the mistake when I was younger of thinking, oh, I don't know what field to set. I just won't bother. And you know, you, you're missing out on a, on a chance to learn there. And it took me until I was about 22 till I started setting my own field like an idiot. You guys can start doing that age, you know, 13, 14, whatever you guys are. That's good. It's going to put you in massive, massively good position compared to me, which took years to be brave enough to do that, which is so stupid. Um, Pasty, obviously, Greece has mentioned it there, but is there anything you look at in batters when you try to work them out past? Um, I'll take that to kind of club cricket. If I'm playing club cricket, um, I just kind of watch their movements. Like I said about Sibs, he's got quite a um, pronounced movement of his hands. So the last time I played club cricket, uh, the first thing the guy did was back away to the leg. So I knew it was pretty much just going to play me over the offside. So then straight away, you know, right, got come tighter to stop his hands coming through. Um, so I think it's just little things like once you've got three or four balls at someone, you kind of get a feel of the movements, get a feel of how they're probably going to go about it, especially in 50 over cricket and stuff, because they're going to want to get on with their scoring. So you're going to get an idea quite soon. So I think it's just like w watching for little movements once you bowl two or three balls and then try and work out what your best plan is to that particular batsman, whether it is trying to tuck him up, whether it's going a bit shorter to him. Um, and then we've chatted about preparation at grounds and stuff and like you said about setting your own field. Don't When you're actually practicing the nets, get used to setting your own field. It's something we do every time we have a net session, we set our own field. We know where our fielders are, so you get a bit more confident on A, setting your own field, but B, knowing what works for you and what doesn't. Yeah. And then secondly, um, James was saying about when you rock up the ground, you've never been there before, someone in your team might have done. So it's a great opportunity just to start chatting with teammates, find out someone else has played there before. So for me, I've signed for Harborn this year. I've never played there, but just chatting to people I already know about the dimensions of the ground, what end might suit me best to bowl from. So it's also a good way of just building up communication with your team and um, the confidence to chat with your teammates. Is there anything you look at when you we try to figure out a batsman? Do you look for anything in particular? Um, I look for any kind of forced shots, I think. Um, yeah, if you kind of play a shot and it wasn't really there to do it, but they tried it anyway, it kind of makes me think, ah, oh, like obviously that's the strength of theirs because if it's not there to do it, you wouldn't do a weakness. So, um, yeah, I just I just look for that, and then if I know that's their strength, I'll try not to try not to let them have an easy shot and try and make them work work for their runs as much as I can, really. Okay. You got anything on that, uh, Jonesy? Or no, I think that's a really good point actually, and it's um, it's something that you know some young players might not actually think that way. Um, so recognizing a full shot and then basically explaining that in your own head as okay they're trying to play me through there so that is one of their strengths that's a really it's a really good way of thinking about it yeah. um and just re again recognizing patterns i think you said that all uh or pasty recognizing trying to recognize patterns in in the way certain players are playing uh, um and that will come with experience but it will also come if you can quickly like like i said to uh, like i said earlier like i mentioned earlier sorry if you can as quickly as possible get out of the frame of mind of thinking too technically and thinking about um, you know, negative consequences of, of your performance uh, and, and just staying in the moment. Uh, we, we say that quite a lot um, at Edgebaston through the winter, like staying in the moment, staying in the game, uh, thinking like a captain, even though you've got a job to do with the ball. Um, all these little things which will get you uh, involved in the game from a tactical point of view, they, they will massively help. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean, like, it doesn't guarantee success and it doesn't mean that you're going to bowl great every single day um, and, and take fifers. But what it, what it will do is it will, get, it will start getting, getting you in a frame of mind where you feel more comfortable um, and you'll, you'll quickly add, add value to your own game, but also to the, to the, the way that uh, your teammate plays the game too. I think, I think it's also important to recognise that as cricketers, we, we have to get quite a lot wrong to get something right. And I think, Jonesy, your point to your point about noticing things, you know, if you're hitting a certain area consistently, you know, if you're not noticing that, you know, and you're not recognising it and making those small adjustments, yeah. i.e., you know, you've you've had a bit of a failure, you've had a bit of a setback, but blimey, as cricketers, we have to fail quite a bit, you know, uh, yeah. to, to improve. Yeah. And I think what I've recognised over the years is that players that deal with that failure quickly and adapt you know 
uh, we're all going to get out or we're going to get hit for four or six. You know, it's not going to be our day every single day, but then you have to adapt quickly, you know, and, and I think tactically that's really important, isn't it? You, you're seeing things all the time in a game that you've got to note and then add it to your next plan or just consider it. And as you say, you know, if you're thinking technically, you haven't got room for all that. You've got to stay in the game and adapt to what you see. I think that's fair. Not yeah, sure. definitely, definitely. Yeah, I made a note here, and I was gonna, I was going to bring it up earlier, but I think it ties on, it goes on the back of what you've just mentioned there quite nicely. I think, for from my experience of playing, um, the the best players and the players who sort of accelerated quickly at a young age uh, and went on to to bigger bigger and better things, I personally think that they are able to get in a frame of mind where yes, they're really confident in their own ability, and and of course they have huge amounts of ability. But they also um, get into a frame of mind where they are thinking constantly about the opposition and they're thinking of ways of um, working working batters out. They're, they're flipping anything that might be deemed a negative into a positive or into an opportunity. Um, so I, I personally think that, that that's, that's the mindset of, of the majority of the players who go on to, to be really su successful in this game. Um, and you know that sometimes is natural, and it comes naturally to some players. But I also think it can can be learnt as well, like any other any other behaviour. And I think it starts by again going back to being really really involved tactically in the game, not thinking too technically, not worried about what mum and dad think or or what the other opposition people think, which which can be difficult sometimes. I understand that, but just coming back to right, okay, so what do I need to do here? What am I trying to do? What is this batsman doing? What's the state of the game? All the things and all the intricacies that go into you know, whether it's a 50 over innings or whether it's a multi-day multi -day game, just stay in the moment, stay in the game for that period of time and you'll give yourself a, a, a really good chance of, of making a difference. I think, that, yeah, I think that's, I, sorry, Pastor, I, I was going to say, I think that that's, that's all dead right and you, you're dead right, Jonesy. On the morning of a game and certainly during a game, you do not want any technical thoughts at all. There is a time for that. That's probably in the few days previous or maybe the, the week previous to a game, but on game day, you want to be competing, don't you? And something I mentioned that's really helped me and something I mentioned, I think, in the Wuxi, um webinar is almost having a constant review system going through your head. So you bowled your ball, you're walking back, thinking to yourself, right, what ball did I want to bowl there? I wanted to bowl top of off ball. A, did I bowl it? And then B, what happened? If I bowled my perfect top of off ball and someone's carved it over cover, then you'd go, oh, well done. You know, you know, I've executed exactly what I wanted not dropping point for bowling a cut ball or you know i've bowled a really poor wide cut ball they've leathered it for four like it deserved i'm not sure you're going to change my feel for that i've reviewed it thought no i got that wrong start again type thing i think having that sort of constant review sort of recycle thing going on in your mind is a, is a I, useful thing i assume and i know liam is going to come in but i assume that that process is accelerated in white ball cricket you know because you know it's almost ball by ball then isn't it you're going through the over you're working out the psychology of a batter. The game, the over is in a certain position. They might have taken so many runs off the over. After ball three, four and five, you've just got to continually sort of adapt and sort of say, OK, where am I now? What is the batter thinking? And then you take your, make your plan accordingly. Is that is that fair? Pat, Liam, can I go to you? Yeah, I think that's definitely fair. For me in uh, 50 over cricket, when we're at that kind of stage, I want all my decision making made before the ball comes back to me because I think then I've got enough time to relax and know what I'm focusing on. So, for example, say I've just, um, I'm bowling to someone like uh, Tom Cullacadmore, who, who I know is a strong picking up, and he's picking up two or three times in a row in front of the square. So I want to, I, before I get the ball back, I want to have made my decision that I'm moving my field in front of the square, and that that is, uh, and my, but my line is fine, but that is, so I've lost my words there. So I've, I've executed the ball I wanted, but I haven't got my field right. Before I get the ball back in my run up, I want to have moved my field because I know I've actually executed what I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So in 50 over cricket, um, like I said, it's accelerated, but I still feel you need time to actually just relax. So if I can get all my decision making done before that ball comes back to me, it gives me a few seconds to catch breath, really focus on what I'm going to do next and what I've decided what my plan is. So. Um, Red Bull Cricket, I think you've got a little bit more time. You can almost think to the top of your market, like Oli saying, review, review system, because you can kind of turn, take a second and go. But um, 
50 over 220. I want all my decisions made before I've got that ball back in my hand. I'm not a big fan of being crowded at the top of my mark either. So if I can have clarity and the captain has confidence in my clarity, then I'd back myself to um, execute that ball. Sorry if that was a bit muddled. Oh, <laughs> that's good. Um, I, I mean, I think you're dead right, Greasers. I mean, if you think about any day's cricket, Ooh. that brand new ball in your hand, you're on the attack, you've got a few slips in. And we're gonna, I know we're going to go up in the fields later. Um, you're your attacking, you've got the brand new ball, you've got a few slips in. Compared to, there's not much swing in the middle of the day, so you've got a deep point out, deep square leg. You still try to bash top of off. And then, oh, it's sort of a defensive field compared to, right, the batters are starting to whack it now. I've got a bull York at death. Now, in a four-day game, it might take two days to do go through, through those stages. In a 50-over game, it might take 20 overs to go through those stages. In a 320, it might be two balls. You might bowl your best ball that swings a bit. Oh, gosh, I need to take my slip out. Second ball might go out of the park, and then you might have to go Yorkers because you're bowling at Joss Butler on a tiny boundary type thing. So going through those phases of attack, defensive field but still bowling top of off to York, to Yorkers and death you know you, you go through that in four day cricket you go through that in 50 over cricket and t20 cricket it's just that how fast you do it exactly like you said Greece this is sort of accelerated the short yeah. of the format um we're going to move on to and batter specific fields um so I suppose I'll come to you first is there is there a, is there a particular batter you've come against where you've set a specific field that you've thought about Set in a specific field or something like that? Um, I think when you've kind of, when you've played against the kind of, when I've played against the kind of higher profile players and you know they're going to kind of, they're going to pick up length really quickly. And I think, I think when we played against Tammy, Tammy Beaumont, we played against uh, Beckenham, which was an absolute road, lightning fast outfield. And yeah, you just kind of, you kind of don't want to be, you just want to kind of preempt what she's going to do and if, if you think if she's going to pick you up quickly and you're not really going to rush her then maybe moving your field in front of square just because that's just going to cover the boundary and it, instead of having people behind where actually realistically especially in women's cricket where you've only got four out it's just trying to make the most of those four and wherever you if you've looked at that batter and you've kind of analysed their their play and you kind of work out where where they're most likely to go then trying to cover that instead of trying to cover what might happen if I don't know they go for a big hoik and they get an edge and it might go to third man whereas you know probably I try and look at the most probable sort of thing as right what is she most likely to do and then go from there really. like it. Uh, and you pass it? Yeah very similar really. Um, so if we're kind of talking about start of an innings kind of thing if I know it's a strong leg side player in a 50 over start of innings I'm more likely to Again, probably like as you said, have your square, square deep, my deep square in front, and I wouldn't have a third man. I'd have a fine leg because I know that's the area he's aiming for. Um, whereas other players, I'll probably start with quite a traditional third man fine leg. Um, so it's all about who you're up against. Red ball cricket, I tend to back my skills to begin with. I have a field that I'm quite comfortable bowling with. I might tweak like a four slip into a gully or a square leg in front or uh, in front instead of behind. Sorry, vice versa, behind instead of front, but. If all day cricket, because you've got more time, I do. I tend to back my skills first, and that this is my field. This is how I feel I'm going to get most batsmen out. Um, and then once they're in, then I'll start to adjust and fiddle around with things. So um, again, it's like anything we've kind of chatted about. So it's just clarity and knowing your role and knowing what you want to do at that moment. Yeah, I suppose a brilliant example of this it would be Sibbers, who was you know a brilliant batter for Warwickshire. Uh, we all watched him play Test cricket this winter. Now. The question Sibbers asks any bowler um, is an interesting one. Just like Steve Smith, just like Jonathan Trotz, this sort of vogue of working it through the leg side is sort of in fashion at the moment. And what Sibbers essentially does is says you, you, you're being brave as a bowler to bowl at the stumps because any balls on the stumps is going to whack you through the leg side. Now, I suppose the, the important thing to do as a young bowler, if you, if you come against something like that, is to adjust whether that's you think, right, I've got my slips in, I've got my, my offside field, I'm going to change my line and bowl wide outside off. That's a fine thing, is that you, you've adjusted. Or you carry on bowling at the stumps because that's where the LBW is and bowled are, but you pack the leg side. So it's someone like Sibbers, you might have a mid on and catching mid wicket, a catching square leg and a, a catching gully, which I think the South Africans end up doing. But I just think it's important when you come up against players like that, 
just a just a like, you know it's, it's important that you do adjust whether like say that's your line or um your field make sure you, you make an adjustment for the, those types of players i don't know if you've got anything on that journey yeah um yeah I, I jotted some stuff down earlier and it, it again it feeds into that quite nicely so um i was going to ask a question to, to you guys still playing really um and you know we're talking about being adaptable um and being self-sufficient cricketers and that's exactly what we're trying to create particularly with our bowlers um and really understanding as a young player understanding when to change uh when to adapt and how to change so you alluded to alluded to it there all um so for me, there's, I've spoken a little bit this year to the, to the bowlers. So adapting, you can do it in, in two ways. Um, you can either change your plan, which is what you just spoke to there, or you can, you can keep your plan the same and change your field. Um, and I think it's important for bowlers to know when to do either. Um, and then also to not jump too far ahead of themselves and then change both. Because I think, I personally think, um, Sometimes, as a as a young player, it can the pressure can get on you, particularly in a one day game, and you you want to, to make too many changes because of the scoreboard pressure or, or whatever, because of certain players coming at you. So then you change your plan and your field, uh, and in in that situation, I think that you, you you don't leave yourself any sort of wiggle room. You play all your ace, you play all your aces, and you show all your cards in one hand, and you don't leave yourself any more any more room to to manoeuvre. So I was going to throw that back to you guys. Um, to get your thoughts on, you know, in one say if, if we stick to one day cricket, which is the majority of the of the of the cricket that, that we play in the pathway. So when would you change just your plan? So keep the field the same, or when would you change your field and keep the plan the same, or when would you do a, a, a sort of mixture of both? I'll go to you all first with that. Um, does the question make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean. I suppose it, it depends on the phase of the game. So, like you mentioned there, it's uh, I, I let's imagine I'm opening the bowling and I'm bowling at Sibbers and I've never played against Sibbers before. I'll probably bowl my first ball near the top of off and it might go through the leg side. In which case, I'd be thinking, well, you know, good good shot, fair play. I've bowled what I wanted there. Um, it's fairly strong through the leg side. I'll just I'll just move my line over a bit. So I keep I've, I've got a brand new ball still. Um, I still want to nick him off. I'm going to use my slips. So I won't change the field at all. I'd just probably have to adjust my line because to Sibbers off stumps too straight, I'd just sort of edge out. And I suppose you, in one day cricket, well, in any cricket really, so you ha your hands are forced by the circumstances sometimes. So let's say by the 10th over, there's absolutely no swing whatsoever. It's pointless me having slips in them. You know, the, the ball's then going to be angling in towards Sibbers' strength. That's when I'd think, right, OK, I'm being forced by the circumstances here. The ball's, the ball's different to what it was at the start. That's when I might start um, moving my, my field over to a mid wicket and that leg side field. And then if I couldn't get him out at all, if I was in a bad day and Sibbers keep whacking me, and all of a sudden he starts to, um, to hold me back and it really run in the 20th over, that's when I might have to start thinking, gosh, I'm going to have to go death here or start mixing up with slower balls and stuff just because my best ball is not productive because, you know, that best ball smashing the top of off to him on that particular day is, is sort of going out of the park. That's, that's what I'd say. I don't know what the. Yeah, so, so yeah, so just before we go to the guys, so you'd say then that you, your plan alters, you, you slightly alter your plan, uh, but you keep your field the same. Yeah, so definitely. To start, first, yeah. yeah, definitely to start with. I mean, um, again, I'd, I'd think about did I execute? I.e., if Sibbers whacks me through the leg side and it's a leg stump half volley, then, you know, I'm the idiot. I need to I need to make sure I'm executing, you know, my, my best ball, my top of a ball. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd just be thinking about my best plan to start with, which at the start of a one-day game would be swinging that new ball away from my right under batter, and I may be just, you know, nudging my plan slightly, i.e. my line, just move my line over really, and then yeah. I'd, I'd wait until the circumstances change, but i.e. the ball stops swinging before I started changing my field. Cool. Don't know if uh, you yeah. want to ask that past as well. Or? Yeah, past. What are what's yeah, your so, thoughts, mate? Uh, for me, I think, uh, it's a lot on gut feel. Um, pretty similar to begin with. I will just back myself, and I will, I will um, change my 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 plan slightly. I'll change my line, or so again, for Silver's example, like Ollie said, you change line slightly outside of stump. But if it's someone else who you feel is going to flay through offside, and you go slightly straighter. But uh, for me, it's when I feel the momentum has started to shift in their favour, I will look to change the field because then Dada won't get too far ahead of me. 
if I'm repeatedly bowling a good ball, but I'm being hit on the top of the bounce through the covers, my slips are coming out and I'm going to plug that gap. Um, just to try and wrestle back that momentum. And then also to frustrate them that their scoring shot is hopefully now um, gone. So uh, for me, it's massively about momentum and gut feel. If I've, if I, I've, if I've bowled two or three balls, and even if he hasn't got one away, my gut is that it's not going to go to a slip today. It's a white ball game, and I'm, I'm not a big swinger of a white ball. I'm going to get them out of there pretty sharpish. Um, but I think it's, for me, like I said, it's about momentum. If I feel his momentum is getting away from me, I, I've got to do something to change. So that's when I might, I will look to change my field, and I'll look to just bring that balance back, back towards uh, our, our side. Yeah, it is. Yeah, on the back of that, as especially what Ollie said earlier, actually, um, a massive one for me is like actually not panicking if if it goes wrong because a lot of the time it will go wrong not because it's a bad plan but because you haven't quite executed it. So I think a massive massive thing that I've like worked hard on the last couple of years is actually knowing the difference between the plan's not working or I've not executed the plan because if you've not executed the plan, you don't no, there's no rush to. You don't need to panic at the top of your mouth like something's got to change. Actually, just focus on trying to trying to execute the plan as best as you can. Whereas if you if you're executing it perfectly and they're still still you know still scoring like you don't want them to, then that's when you start to tinker with it or potentially move your field. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Um, and I think yeah, as, as a coach from my limited limited time and experience as a coach so far um thinking back to some of the games last year uh i can think of definitely think of some of examples where fields change too soon so um you know bowlers or captains maybe panicking maybe getting too far ahead of themselves with what's happening with the batters but also on the flip side uh i can also think of examples where the fields weren't changed quick enough and obviously there's a fine balancing act to be, to be had there um and that suggests that in those certain circumstances or those examples uh, we perhaps weren't um fully engaged uh, from a tactical point of view with what was going on so again to, to the, all the boys and girls listening um i think it just goes back to the fact what we said at the start um what we said at the start about being almost being proactive so you know, being really confident and uh with your fields and your strengths and that will be a really good starting point um, because then you will be able to be proactive. You can think on your feet a little bit more. Whereas if you've, you've not got sort of a foundation uh, to, to build from, then that's probably when you see or when we'll see um, sort of uh, a, a reactive sort of field settings or, or, or literally no, no sort of reaction at all. I think this, this follows on really nicely. We've had a, a great question from uh, Zain Ahmed come through which says, what, what do you guys think about when you're going around the park? Do you still think about taking wickets or do you think about going defensive? Um, it's a great question and one that's not easily answered. So I'll come I'll come to you first, Pass. What do you reckon to that? When you're going around the park, um, do you do you keep attacking or do you go defensive? I think the first thing is just take a breath, you know, um, just try and relax yourself and just have clear thoughts about whether it's someone just playing ridiculous shots or whether you are really mis, mis executing So um, I think in cricket, you've always got to look to take wickets, but if you go around the park at the death, that could literally be, right, what is my best way of making him miss hit one? Yeah. So I played in a game where someone's got 34 ball 100, and literally I had, I was, I was frazzled at the end of my mark, and I'm trying to work out what to do. Hamish Marshall came over to me, who uh, has played a lot of international cricket, told me to take a breath, and he just said, right, he's hitting everything cleanly. Let's be honest, you could bowl your best ball and it could still go to six here. What's our best percentage opportunity of making a miss hit one? So we just started throwing it in short. And I think just that breath and second, just to realise, right, big boundary. He's, yeah, he's hitting it well, but that's the biggest part of the ground. Let's just make him hit there. We eventually got him out, but it was... Um, I think, yeah, if you're going around parts, take a second, take a breath, think, is he just having an unbelievable day or am I mis-executing? If he's mis-executing, then think, what can you do to slightly um, adjust your uh, bowling or adjust your lines or your lengths? But I think just try and stay as relaxed as possible. 
the more you worry about it, the more you panic about it, the worse it's going to get. Yeah, it's my opinion. Sure. You think, easy, what do you reckon? Sorry, sorry, John, do you go? No, no, easy, can go first, that's fine. I reckon easy. the, uh, like Patsy just said, trying to take a, actually take some time and just actually compose yourself at the top of your mark because it's, I found it myself, like, it's so easy to just, just bowl and then turn around, walk back and then bowl again and actually that kind of pause at the top of your mark to actually think and still formulate a plan and not get kind of too built up in it is, um really useful and actually it kind of almost takes the momentum out of the batter sometimes because if the batter's batting well and they're they're getting into a nice routine and you're just bowling walking back bowling walking back actually that little pause may just break something you know in their head just break that kind of momentum for them and actually just thinking and i always try and attack the stumps so i always think at the end of the day if i'm attacking the stumps you like you miss I hit so that's why I kind of try and think of I definitely definitely trying to still take wickets but like Pastor said using the ground using the dimensions if there is a longer boundary then trying to get them to hit that really. Sorry John's I interrupted you then. No it's fine mate it's fine um I think if we just if we relate it to um say if you think about multi-day cricket as well which some of the boys and girls will be playing this year and you know we've all had we've all had uh spells where you know, it's it's red ball cricket, um, first innings. So we've got catchers behind the bat and, you know, we're looking to take wickets and we just, you know, for whatever reason, it's just not going well. We're not bowling well. We've not hit our rhythm. We're leaking runs left, right and centre. Um, so in that situation, then it, it can sometimes can be difficult um, to sort of know what to do for the best. And I think what can, and if, if, if it's a situation where you're just not executing and you're just, you know, you're bowling freebies to the batters and they're not necessarily, you know, swinging from, from the, you know, sw swinging from the hip. Oh, yeah, the hip. Yeah, that, that was it. Swinging from the <laughs> hip. Um, you know, in that situation there, then, um, you know, it's, it's, it's all well and good saying, oh, you, you've got to adjust or whatever. Um, so I've lost my train of thought. Yeah, what I was going to say was, yeah, red ball cricket, um you're not executing your plan and you know you're not executing your plan um but you know as as the as overs go by you're still not able to execute you still i think you have to have some sort of consideration towards the conditions and the pitch as well yeah so you know if it's a, if it's a good pitch and it's carrying and the swing and you know if you do bowl your best ball and and you do get an edge you still want uh, catchers there to take the catch for you because the last thing you want to do is to, to you know to, to completely change the field put scouts out everywhere then you yeah. bowl get a, a good ball and you find the edge and then it goes for four um so that, that obviously it's a it's a balancing act and it is a it is a difficult uh, question to answer because you know there's so many um so many variables within the different formats to try and account for um but if it is, you know, if it's if it's uh, if it's not a great pitch and um, there's, there's no carry and there's no way you can see it carrying to the slips, it might be that you're in the first spell and you're an opening bowler. You might have to um, move, get the slips out um, a bit quicker than you potentially normally would. Yeah. Um, but I think if if you if you're having a if you're having a bad day or a bad spell, a couple of you know two or three bad overs, you're going around the park. Um, but you know the conditions are still favouring the bowlers. I'd say. You know, try and try and stick to your guns a little bit and and back yourself. Um, and again, I think in that in that moment there, then it sort of touches on what Izzy and, and Pasty said. You still want to be thinking about taking wickets, but you have to adjust and you have to adapt. Yeah, but it's a it's a great question, and I, I suppose what I, what we've all said there is it depends why you're going around the park. If you're bowling your best ball and mm -hmm. someone's whacking it, then you got you've got to adjust. You know. Taking a slip out and putting a catching mid wicket in or a deep square leg could be just as good as nicking someone off. If you're going around the park because you're not bowling your best ball, then you obviously have to adjust. I think that's the sort of key takeaway there, isn't it? Yeah. Um, okay, moving on a little bit. Um, white ball tactics, and I think we, this might go hand in hand, Grace. We've got some some one day fields and some fields here. So. Um, Pasty, in your opinion, you know what ball to be a good white ball bowler? What balls do you need? What balls do you need to um, succeed? Uh, I, think, I think to be a good white ball bowler, you need two good variations, two good change ups of pace, um, and you need to be able to uh, know your Yorker. I think if you look at the best in the world, um, if you look at someone like Mitch Stark, he's got a gun Yorker. 
just hits it repeatedly. At the top, he bowls good pace and hits his good red ball areas. And then he has his cutters as well. So I think you just need a, at least two varieties as well as a good Yorker to be effective. Um, but you don't have to have searing pace. If you look at some of the people who've been the best bowlers in county cricket recently, Benny Howe from Gloucestershire is just a bag full of tricks. He doesn't bowl at any great pace, but he's got, well, he, I think he claims he's got about eight different versions of knuckleballs, but he's probably got one or two. Um, I know, don't worry, I can say that. Uh, he's got a back of hand, he's got leg cut, he's got off cutters, he's got ones where he takes his thumb off the ball, he's got a bag full of tricks. So um, you don't have to have great pace, but I think what you do need, you need more than, you need two or more variations and you need to be able to hit a Yorker because then you know you've got balls you can go back on. If things, ball is going around the park, if you are under pressure, you've got balls you know you can nail and rely on. Yeah, things as as that, that, just, that, that goes hand in hand, I suppose, with a good stock ball as well, doesn't it? I mean, you can have all the variations in the world. Can have a brilliant, if I've got a brilliant back of a hand, uh, but my stock ball's a load of rubbish, then you know that's no good, is it? Um, there, is, that, is that field on screen now, Greasers, or? Which one would you like, mate? Well, should we should we go with this? I mean, I'm, we'll just discuss it. But this start of a 50 over game, this is a, a field I took together. Yeah, I'm boys now, mate. See that home. Um, so the reason I, I put that together, that's my field, guys. Feel free to disagree with it. Is I've got two slips in because I'm thinking it's going to swing. And this is literally for the first ball of the game. Um, I've got a fine leg in in case I get it too straight. I've got a cover in, a point in, a mid off, a mid on, a square leg. Um, like I said, my main thinking here would be I want it to swing. I'm going to try and nick them off. Um, if they play a brilliant shot and whack me over the top of my head, then you know, well done to them. But um, that's what's what's what I'm thinking. I don't know what you guys think of that. Slips are a bit far back for you, aren't they? All? Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Good shot. No, I tend to agree. I tend to I tend to agree with the field. Um, for me, sometimes I will start with a square leg instead of a fine leg just because I know my most common bad ball is a drift onto the legs and it uh, flick through square leg. Um, but generally, I tend to agree. The only times I might uh, not start two sips is if we've, say, batted first and we know at the slow pitch, I might start with catching the wicket and one slip. But that's that's only something you can know on the day if you've already batted on the pitch or such like. But um, I think it's a pretty stock standard feel. I think that's what you'd see most people go with. Yeah. Is it, what, any thoughts on that? Um, personally, I tend to probably start with just the one slip and then have a cover as well as the extra just and okay. just try and hit top of off really. But yeah, same sort of idea really, just obviously the one less slip and the extra protection on the off side. And I suppose the, the magic here is, much like Jonesy said, is that knowing when to adjust this is really the, the magic if it's if i'm playing at portland road and it's a green seam and it's doing all sorts and the ball's swinging around then i would happily bowl with this field all day long let's let's bowl this bowl the team out for 50 runs let's not change a thing now the day after i might be playing at edge baston against joss butler on a 20 yard boundary and it's the flattest pitch in the world i might bowl with this field for one ball i don't think oh god no I need to bring fine leg up, put square leg out and lose both slips. Is that a fair shout, Jonesy? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think what's important for us to do just while we're on, on this right now on the topic um, and relating it back to, you know, the boys and girls that are watching and also the club cricket on a Saturday, you know, yeah. 50 and 55 over cricket and, and some of the county, county age group cricket, um, he's actually played with red balls. So it's like whites and red balls. So how yeah. would, you know, throwing it again, throwing it back to you, sorry to keep passing the book but no. you know, what would you, what would your recommendations be as, as a guy's player playing now would there be any modifications to this field here because you know we're talking about this as your as your white day uh, sorry white ball fields yeah um, see red ball gives us a little bit a little bit more so what changes would you make to that it's still 50 overs 55 overs but it's a red ball so Greece can we put the uh, I mean I've called it different I've put it's my four day field but um it's the same thing I suppose you're talking open the ball in on a, on a Saturday um, and it's a red ball swinging I'd have something like this like Pasty mentioned earlier he's looking to attack I'd be looking to attack I'm, I'd like to think I could swing that new ball it doesn't swing like you mentioned Jonesy I'd have to adjust quickly but I'd have three slips in a gully a point uh, a mid off mid on a square leg and a fine leg like I say I am looking to attack yeah, um, try to come off. Try hit the stumps. When, um, when, when would that? When would that change? So you know, I'd imagine, I'd imagine your first change would probably what lose third slip. 
Yeah, again, it, it much much like we've talked about, it depends on what's happening. If it, if it's doing all, all sorts, then let's not change a thing. But if it's if if I bowl three balls and bowl three overs and it stops swinging all of a sudden, then yeah, I'd be bringing probably third slip into cover, so two slips in a gully and three on the offside. Yeah. Um, if it's someone like Sibbers, like we mentioned, I might keep my two slips, two slips, but bring a third slip into mid wicket and drop square leg. You know, th those sort of variations go hand yeah. in hand with the actor. But so yeah, I'd. Yeah, in those in those situations, examples there. So you've you've dropped third, you've you've lost third slip. Third slips come out, and the, what's the, what about the plan? So the, has the has the plan changed, or is are you still still sticking to the plan? Are you still looking to bowl exactly the same, but you've just you know, tweaked to the field? I don't know. I don't know what the other guys think, but it's certainly in four day cricket, it, it doesn't really change a great deal. I'm looking to my best ball at the top of off with a bit of a way of swing with the off bouncer. That yeah. is sort of my my, and I'm trying to be as boring as I can. Now we've had a good question here about what happens if there's no swing. Well, if there's no swing in four-day cricket. If there's no movement, I'm still looking to hit the top of off. You know, it's it's the plan hasn't changed. It's just the ball's doing something a bit different. So I'm trying to bash away at the top of off on a good length as hard as I can. I just might change the field a little bit. I don't know what the other guys think of that. It's fascinating. No, uh, definitely. If there's no swing, um, I'll probably maybe lose a slip or two, but. You've still just got to be attacking and aggressive. You've got to bowl your best ball every as much as possible, you know. Um, you might look to bowl three quarter seam. So instead of holding it upright, you might just twist the seam slightly at one way or the other, just to try and create a bit of seam movement. Or you might, uh, so for me, my, my standard grip is there. I might split my fingers, uh, just try and create a bit of wobble. But um, even if there's no swing, no nip, no nothing, you've, in four day cricket, you've got to bowl your best ball over and over. And I'd say in um, 50 over red ball cricket, you're just looking to bowl until they start until they start to look to hit you out of the park. I think you've just got to keep bowling your best ball because the red balls do stay in good shape. You can shine them up, you can swing them better than a white ball. So I think the, the more attacking you can be with a red ball in 50 over cricket, the better. I think it'll keep you in a good mindset and it'll keep you in the hunt for wickets. Yeah, 100%. good point. And then just... Um, my question to you, Izzy, on that would be obviously the our, our county age group girls play with with pink balls. So obviously you've had experience of playing with pink balls. So you know how how does that compare to red ball cricket? I know you've you've, you've definitely played red ball, but probably not that much. But yeah, so any advice for the for the uh, county age group girls on the pink balls and and would the field be similar to this? Um, I think with a pink ball they'll swing for you know anything from the first half over so the first three balls to the first kind of you know if you look after it really well they'll, they'll maybe swing for five five ten overs if you're lucky but yeah they don't tend to last very long at all so it's just kind of working out at the start of the game is it swinging and with a pink ball it probably most likely is they tend to be a bit smaller so I find when it's a smaller ball I get more swing simply because my hand goes down the back of it a bit faster but um yeah so I think if then it's just identifying when it's actually stopped swinging so that you can you slightly adjust your adjust your line maybe if if you were going at top of off and it was swinging away and suddenly it stopped swinging then you might find that actually you're getting a bit too a bit too straight if you're if you're still going for the same space but the ball stops swinging so I think it's just identifying that change and with a pink ball um, more than a red ball from my experience it, it happens quite quickly so it's just being kind of tuned in tuned into that and identifying it when you can really it just com comes back to making sure that as a bowler you, you're being proactive and you and you're staying in, involved mentally in the game and you're actually thinking about what's happening and you're not just running in you know bowling you might have bowled a good ball you might have bowled a bad ball you might have gone for four you know, but if 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 we're in a frame of mind where we're actually thinking about it and we're trying to you know piece things together and we're trying to work our way towards you know the, the end the end of the innings and and either taking wickets or restricting their score as long as we're thinking tactically uh, um, and we're involved in the game like you just said there is he then you know, we'll be we'll be at least we'll be on the on the right sort of footing to start off with but if we're not thinking if we're not involved in the game and, and we're not thinking tactically we're not you know we're not thinking about um, what's just happened in a in a game sense, then you know we're going to make our lives a lot harder. 
And that, it's a great point by Izzy that something for, we forget as bowlers because quite often we go net and we've got a brand new ball in. We always pick the best ball out of the bag. Um, balls deteriorate, whether it's a red ball, a white ball. Um, red balls obviously deteriorate a bit slow, slower, white balls deteriorate quicker, but balls deteriorate, meaning they will move less. And so having that constant monologue in your head, again, reviewing each ball, thinking, oh, did that one swing a bit less? Or is it starting to swing a bit less? And even, you know, if I've bowled and I'm handing over to Pasty, I might say something like, oh, it's, it's hooping. 10 out of 10 swing, if you think of a scale, you know, it's absolutely hooping. Or I might say zero out of 10 swing, you know, there's no swing at all. Just helping your teammates out in that in that way, you know, is, is going to help you as well. Um, should we move back, back on to a few fields, guys? Um, obviously, we've touched on four-day cricket. We've touched on the start of the 50-over game, which is pretty similar, the four-day start of field and the start of the 50-over field. This is what I field I'd set, personally. Again, the other guys might be different, in the middle of the 50-over game. So I'm thinking there's no shape at all here. Um, and you, you could have this field equally in a, in a four-day game as well, but may, maybe you'd have a slip. But there's no swing at all. The ball's just angling into the stumps. I'm trying to still bowl my best ball, hammer away at the top of the stumps, but there's no shape. I've got a third man on fine leg, you know, for those sneaky nicks. And should I get a bit wide, I've got a deep point for a cut. And should I get a bit straight, I've got a deep square um, for a pull. Again, I'm thinking I'm going to bowl such a good length that if they want to try whack me over the top, back over my head, then good luck to them. But I suppose in essence, then, in one day cricket, you know, it's in the batter's favour. There's not going to be any shape for me. But to that field, I can bowl several different balls. I can bowl my stock ball, I can bowl a bouncer. I can bowl a few slower balls into the wicket. And that's sort of what I'd be thinking in the middle overs of a, of a 50 over game. Um, don't know what you think of that, Izzy. Can I, can yeah. I, sorry, Izzy, can I just throw in there? Because you've got a very split field there, Ol. Um, yeah. A lot of spins, uh, I know that we talk to, to our bowlers quite a bit and a lot's been said about sort of not giving the, the batter space and room to free the arms in this period and really kick on their innings. Um, and sort of angling the ball into the hip, maybe just back of a length, you know, when you don't have a lot of movement, certainly in white ball cricket. Is that yeah. is that valid with this field? You know, sort of thinking about the room that you're giving a batter, maybe changing your angle in, at the crease, sort of angling in to restrict that movement? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you definitely get that in one-day cricket, that sort of angle in and, you know, sliding onto the top of middle stump. I suppose I, suppose I was thinking with this field, you've got two batters who are in, really. So, you know, my margins are small. Like I say, your margins are very small with a white ball. So even one that's just outside off stump, someone like Joe Root, Josh Butler, they're going to cut that. So that's why I've got my deep point out. But you're dead right. If, I, if I've just got a wicket and a brand new batter comes in, I'm bringing point up. I, want to, I don't want to give them an easy single there. This is a type of field you've got to... Two guys who are in, really. Um, and when you, say deep point, when you say deep point there, Ollie, um, yeah. you've still got a you've still got a point on one there backward, haven't you? Yeah. So yeah. That's, sorry, I should probably be saying a deep cover point, really. So yeah. that the guy out on the boundary on the offside is is in front of square. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, I've still got that guy in who's on a just a backward of a point, but backward of a point line. But yeah, if I if there's a brand new batter and I've just got a wicket, I would definitely be bringing point up because I don't want to. An easy single. I'd be probably leaving my third man, my fine leg, and my deep square out. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Sorry, is. Oh no, I was just going to say, um, like Ollie said, having a field that's kind of quite versatile, I think, especially in the middle overs, and not almost not letting the batters kind of guess what you're going to bowl. So having a number of deliveries which you can bowl to that field. Um, so I think it kind of keeps that element of decision making for the batter, and actually they've still got to think, oh, well, it's. I don't know, it could be here or here, and trying to almost play that game in their heads with them as well, as well as on the uh, pitch. Okay. I think so, sorry, sorry. Go on, go on, Jordan. I was just going to say, it, it's also worth bearing in mind as well, um, sort of what fielders you have in, in what situation, and it's probably, that's obviously probably more important towards the end of the innings, where runs are more of a premium. But you might be wanting thinking of thinking about, say, this in this scenario here, in those middle of in those middle overs, you still want to try and be squeezing as much as you can. You, if you bowl yeah. a good ball top of off, you don't want it to go in for a run. Yeah. So your your fielders at point, extra cover, and mid wicket on the one there, they're they're really important positions there. So you're you're probably going to want you know your better fielders in those three positions because that's going to maximise your chance of of keeping those those good balls to dot balls. 
Yeah. Uh, where oh, that's it, a great, it, that's in the, a great point. at the end at the end of the innings, you might want your better fielders on the boundary. You know what I mean? You might you might flip it a little bit, so you might get you might get bowlers, a fellow bowler in those positions on on the edge of the circle, and the better fielders sort of out on the on the boundary trying to save those those boundaries. And I think it's a great point. Like quite often we can see a 30 yard circle and people just go stand on it. I've on purpose here put the cover and mid wicket and the point, backward point, quite tight because you're dead right. I still want to be bowling the best ball here. Hopefully if they're blocking it, then I don't want them to be getting easy singles here. I think you're dead right there, Jonesy. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Should we move on to the death field, Greethers? Just yeah. a bit of a generic death field. I'll, I'll talk you through my thinking here, guys. You, you might dis disagree. So I'm thinking this is a death. You know, the, the guys, the last couple of overs, maybe a T20 or 50 over, they, you know, they're looking to whack it. This said, it certainly wouldn't be my death field if two tail enders are in, you know, with 20 overs to go. But this is a couple of batters are in and there's the plenty of wickets to hand and they, they try to whack it. So I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to bowl majority Yorkers. Again, this is to a right handed batter, they've all been to right handed batters. Because I'm bowling mainly Yorkers, deep square, deep mid wicket, uh, long on, long off. And I do have a, uh, a deep point as well, just for that one that sometimes really good batters can sort of squeeze out there. Um, but th that's that's my idea with that field. And I would be able to bowl a few different balls to this field. So I'll be able to bowl Yorker, I'll be able to bowl slower balls. And probably because Jones has already mentioned I'm not that quick, I'd happily bowl bouncers to this field because I think because I'm not that quick, my bouncers would go out to deep square leg or deep mid wicket. If you were really quick, someone like Stoney, would probably have to bowl a bouncer with your fine leg out um, instead. Instead, but um, that would be my thought at the death. I think I can bowl three different balls to that field, um, like Izzy said, mix it up a little bit. And but I'm mainly thinking Yorkers, and hopefully I'm going to get catches out at long arm deep mid wicket. I don't know what you guys think of that. No, I, I like the field. It's pretty much what I'll go with. Um, like I said, you've got multiple balls to bowl to it. And there's, um, you get a bit of uh, leeway as well. If you don't quite execute, you've got your covering. The only things that I might look to do is say I've got, you mentioned a couple of times, someone like a butler, somebody who's going to scoop and ramp. I'll probably bring, you'd have to just risk something and potentially bring your mid off up and put your fine leg back. But then that's judging the situation and judging where the greater risk is. Um, also, if I was going to bowl that one, then you have got the option of the bumper. But like I said, um, we, 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 we don't bowl the pace of stone or brooks, so our top edge is more likely to go up rather than carry way down there. But uh, I think, I like as you said, like you've said, a field where you can bowl multiple balls to is what you need at this stage, and that to me is that field. Um, is it fair to say that the dimensions of a ground might have an impact at this stage of, a, of an innings? Well, probably any stage of an innings. But, you know, I'm thinking at a pro, you know, if you bowl into the short side at Trent Bridge, for example, and normally there's a short side there, but or if there's a ground that the boys and girls are playing, it's particularly small on one side. How's that going to affect your thinking? Do you think? I think I think you're dead right. You know, you'd be stupid, like Izzy said, not to use the dimensions to your benefit. So this this field we've got here, let's imagine, you know, there's a nice big leg side boundary, perfect. If there's a tiny leg side boundary. You can't really bowl, you know, this this plan's not a great plan. So then I might be looking to bowl wide outside off with the offside out. So maybe third man out, deep point out, long off, long on, and maybe a mid wicket because I'm trying to bowl wide York or something like that. But yeah, I think you're dead right. You'd be, you'd be stupid not to use either dimensions or prevailing conditions uh, in your favour, really. You know, whether that be wind, whether that's boundaries, you know, you, you've got to sometimes just go, despite wanting to bowl at the stumps, at the death and whatnot, You'd be stupid not to use the, you know, the big boundaries to help you sometimes. I think uh, just quickly, if there are any girls watching, obviously women's cricket, we can only have four out. So, you know, um, I I remember a bit of advice I was told a couple of years ago, one of my coaches, and he said, when you're bowling at the death, especially as you've only got four fielders out, uh, cover your line. And then if you miss your length, you've still got protection. Whereas if you try and bowl to a certain length, then there's always a risk that, you know, the ball's not going to go where you've only got your four fielders. So I think that's a really good example there of how you've kind of packed the leg side. And obviously, yeah. if I was bowling to that in a women's game, I'd probably take the point, uh, the cover point, put them in the ring and try and pack that offside and 
give them the leg side and try and bowl it in at their pads probably and get them to hit that's, the sweepers. That's a great point, is, and I suppose with that field there, any ball you bowl somewhere near leg stump, whether that's a bouncer or a yorker, is going to be a good ball to that field, isn't it? You know, and whether that's pace on, pace off, as long as it's at the stumps or around about middle and leg, then that should hopefully go to that field, shouldn't it? I think um, I think it's just worth mentioning here and to the, the guys and girls listening. Um, and what I think is important about this field and what I stressed last year, uh, a, a couple of games um, to the bowlers, and I want them to, I've encouraged them throughout the winter as well to get used to, is bowling with a third man in the circle. Um, because it gives you, it just gives you uh, a bit of relief and it gives you that extra man out that you m might not potentially have if you stick with the third man. And I think sometimes um, young bowlers, young players just get into a routine of setting the field and it's finally third man. And it's just, it's almost like a habit. And so that to have third man in the circle sometimes feels a bit strange, but it's certainly, you know, this field here and third man in the circle is, is certainly uh, very, very popular now in, in the professional game. So I've, I've tried to encourage guys throughout the winter and last year to get used to having that third man up um, just because it gives you, like I said, it gives you that release, gives you uh, an extra fielder out. And, you know, if if a guy at the end of the innings, if if two batters who are, you know, um, flying it to all parts, if you've got a third man up and then they try and start running it down, well, that's, that's in our favour as a bowler because it's changing their plan. Yeah. So yeah, I can think to a number number of games last year where we were going all around the park uh, and we still had third man in. Uh, yeah. So I think it's really important that that the young guys start start practicing that and getting used to it because you know if it's 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 becoming more and more popular. I think that's dead right, and it, you know something my pastor mentioned. You know, if if people are massive scoopers and stuff, then you you can start putting third man and fine leg back. But I, I, at the death, I'd be thinking, you know. These three particular fielders on the leg side are where most balls are going to go, just because people slog towards the leg side. You're hopefully going to be trying to bowl Yorks at the stump. So th those three are probably where it's going to go. Um, the the two on the off side, the deep point and the, the long off, they're probably the ones that can move out there, whether that be keep them two or put in third man final leg. But I, th I think you're dead right at the death. How many balls actually go down to third man? Very, very, very little. Are there? I think your point there as well, uh, just quickly, your point there about you know the leg side is predominantly where everyone tries to slog it, isn't it? We're trying to you're trying to get quick runs, you're trying to score boundaries. Most people are going to be going heaving it towards the leg side. So I think Pasty mentioned earlier about a good one day bowler will have two variations, and that's something that we speak about quite a lot with the pathway. And for me, the two variations ideally would be that grip and spin and bounce away from the outside edge of a batter, both a right hander and a left handed batter. So if you think about a right arm bowler having an off cutter, which is, you know, it's pretty easy, easy ball to bowl. Uh, well, depending on, on, on your release position, some, it's, it's easier for some than others. But if you have if you think about an off, off cutter, that's going to turn into a right handed batter. You know, so that goes in that almost plays into a batter's uh, uh, game plan at the end of an innings where it's turning into their hitting arc. So I, I, I try and encourage guys to, to produce or develop a, a, a a slower ball that can go the other way so whether that's uh, back of the hand slow ball which grips and goes the other way slightly or a, a genuine leg cutter um i think those are valuable tools because if you can if you can have have balls that turn and go away from the outside edge um as a batter you have to you have to time that ball a lot a lot more cleanly than uh, an off cutter that's turning into your hitting arc um so i thought that's, that's just worth mentioning there too yeah, it's a good show. But I mean, I mean what Pasty said at the start, where you, you know, a good stop ball, two good variations, a good yorker, and a good bouncer, they're the tools you need in in one day cricket. It's all well and good setting this field, but if I'm terrible at bowling yorkers and they keep being short and wide pies, then you know this field's pointless. You know, those those couple of balls there are, are absolutely key key in one day cricket. Uh, I think Greethers, I think we're probably pushing time here, aren't we, bud? Um, as ever, we could have probably gone on for another hour and a half. Um, love a bit of badger fast bowling chat, everyone. Um, but yeah, thank you for me. I've, I've loved it again. I don't know if you guys want to say anything to finish. Jonesy? 
Yeah, just just thanks again, guys. Yeah, thanks, Paul, for for organising it and OHD for being your usual usual great self, mate. And yeah, Pasty and Izzy, good to see you. Um, yeah, I've enjoyed it, and hopefully, you know, guys, uh, boys and girls uh, listening and watching at home have taken something from it. Um, yeah, and hopefully we uh, get back to some sort of normality in the in the coming weeks and months. Um, but yeah, hope, hope everyone's enjoyed it, and hope everyone's safe. And well. Izzy, thanks very much indeed. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for organising it, Greethers and, and Ollie. Pleasure. Uh, Liam, brilliant to see you, mate. Cheers, thanks for having me. Um, really enjoyed it and I uh, hope people watching got something from it. Uh, I'm sure they have, mate. It sounds yeah. like you've got a little person looking, trying yeah. to find you somewhere. He's just at the bottom of the stairs, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, on behalf of everybody listening, an, another fascinating hour, and uh, exactly um, what was uh, what it said on the tin, and that was having a really in-depth look at the tactical side of the game, uh, whether that be field settings, uh, mindset, working batters out, absolutely top draw from from all of you. What a brilliant insight for people to hear. Um, and by the time we get to the next webcast, which is next uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, details to follow tomorrow. Um, Mr Johnson might have some hopeful news for us on Sunday, um, but we'll see what he has to say. And uh, maybe, Please. It's, yeah. Can I just? Uh, I, I was a bit annoyed. Like I don't know what you guys felt. Like there was a there was a batting webcast that went out last week, and you didn't ask any of us to get involved. Like <laughs> what, what's that about? Mate, they were they were fighting over each other to get involved in that one. Sure. Uh, unfortunately, Mosley and Bell won that one. So, uh, but uh, we, we we might do a, a tail end of batting chat. That might be quite interesting. <laughs> I've got They'll more first class hundreds than Mosley. <laughs> yeah, that'd be yeah, maybe not maybe not tail ender, but uh, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, fingers crossed that. Uh, the Prime Minister gives us something to, to really hope for on Sunday. and um, But in the meantime, thanks for joining us. Uh, and until the next time, have a good evening. Go and clap for the NHS. Cheers, guys. Cheers.